Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on speech and language in the early years. My name is Jessica Plunkett and I will be hosting today's webinar. The aims of today's webinar are to explore typical speech and language development in the early years, consider the importance of all aspects of communication, discuss what, what we can do to promote and support speech and language development, and explore options for supporting communication if a child presents with a delay or disorder. We will answer questions at the end of the webinar. I will now hand over to Joanne, who is the speech and language therapist at Flying Start Children's Therapy. So the first slide just highlights how communication um, really begins from um, infancy, from the very first days, and this quote just highlights that by saying, early interactions between infants and parents are mainly exchanges of emotions and start soon after birth with eye contact and the changes in the infant's behavioural state. So if we look in newborn babies and their um, very first um, attempts at communication, what we know about them is they go through cycles of sleep and wakefulness and a huge amount of their communication is based on us interpreting their crying patterns. It's also important to note that eye contact is established within days as well as facial expressions. So by that we mean when a child is feeding, they're often looking into their caregiver's eyes um, and um, we interpret some of their facial expressions and smiles can often develop very early as well. But we describe communication at this stage as pre-intentional and by that we mean that the child is communicating without almost realising that there's an intent there. So an example of this would be a child cries when they're hungry, but actually in the beginning that's about the physical sensation of being hungry and the unpleasant feeling that that gives them, so they're crying as that expression and the caregiver interprets this as they must be hungry. And what happens over time is that the infant then learns to use this as an intentional communication. So they learn, when I cry, um, mum feeds me. So then they begin to use this as an intent to communicate their hunger. So this really highlights how important it is that as a caregiver that we're very responsive in those early days and cue into those very early types of communication and that we react and respond to those appropriately to move it from pre-intentional to intentional communication. So how does a baby communicate? Well, the basics are the vocalizations that they make, the eye contact, so looking at us or looking at an object of interest to them. Um, smiling is a very obvious form of communication, as is crying in an, a young baby. But if we think about some of the more subtle communications that we might see in a child, there are very early gestures, such as pushing something away to reject it. Um, there are um, more subtle things such as um, a blinking, startled um, appearance for a child and eyes widening, which can often show um, early stages of fear. So, for example, if there, something's happening to them that they don't like, often a newborn child will splay their fingers and even cover their face in a very protective measure. And we sometimes see this on neonatal units, particularly if someone is trying to feed a child too early when they're not ready. And we talk about queuing into that sort of communication as a readiness for, for feeding. Um, also, states of alertness, whether a child is wakeful or not, can be a, a form of communication. So in the very early days a child can go into different um, modes of alertness and we need to interpret this as communication. So around one to two months communication starts to become much more refined and we are moving into that intentional communication and this is when some parents describe how they can interpret different cries for different needs so they recognize a cry for hunger versus a cry for feeling very tired. If we assume that there's no hearing impairment or anything that may be impacting on communication, an infant starts to still to sudden noise and will look very intently at someone speaking to them so they're showing readiness for that, that listening. At this point, the vocalizations that they're using can be described as coos and gurgles and throaty sounds um, and they generally tend to be used when a child's in a very content state so we can interpret that, that the child is, is settled and content. 
So between three and five months, a child's starting to refine their listening skills so that they can locate a sound source, so um, the sound of a rattle or a particular voice they may turn to. And now they may start to use those vocalizations in response to someone else speaking to, so, to in response to their voice. So that's really early two-way part of communication developing. And again, these vocalizations start to become more refined so that you can tell us a happy sound which shows pleasure versus a sound that's starting to denote some distress. Around six to nine months, that's when we expect that they would start to recognize a familiar voice and would um, would recognize um, who that might be, so they would turn to that familiar voice. And we also may begin to see that they're recognizing that their name is being called, so that they're starting to show very, very early understanding. Vocalizations become much more tuneful. We get vowel sounds and some consonant sounds are developing. And we can hear those in both single sounds, so a single vowel like ah, and some double syllables, so that would be things like abba, as well, so you're getting two sounds together. Again, you might see some more of those very early gestures, particularly the pushing away for refusal, so if they don't want a feed, they may push um, that away. And it's this stage when we really need to think about reciprocating and extending that babble. So we need to listen to their babble, we need to copy it and respond to it, and show them how we can extend it, so add another sound on, um, extend the syllables. And we also need to look for and interpret these early, early gestures, such as the pushing away, and respond to that accordingly. Again, to show the infant that their communication is useful, it's understood, and we're responding how they wish us to. So around 9 to 12 months, we start to get some early emergence of understanding of language. Now at this stage, it's what we might call routine or contextual or um, in addition to a gesture. So by that, we might find that um, a young child understands something like no, because it's used very much in a context where they might be doing something that um, they're not wished to do, as something that they hear very regularly, or for example, a parent's asking them to come up, but also accompanying that with a gesture such as outstretched arms. So what we find is they're drawing on what's happening in the environment and what they're hearing regularly in the same way, and they're using that information to help them understand those words. Gestures are now becoming more refined, so we might start to see a shake of the head for no, and a wave may emerge as a copied gesture. In addition, a communicative point may begin, so that may be a pointing for something that they want, or even a point to show um, an adult something. And that's a really important part of communication, is that that point because it shows an emergence and an awareness of joint attention. So if I point to something, someone will look at what I'm pointing to and they may give it to me. If I point at something, someone may look and respond to me. Our babble is now becoming much um, wider range of consonants and syllable strings. So you get that early dad dad. Um, and what happens with that is um, that's sort of pre-intentional. So a child's not necessarily saying dad. But because that sounds like dad or daddy, often adults will interpret that with meaning, and that's how that then progresses on to developing into word, because the infant sees that someone likes it when I do this, someone repeats this, someone's praising me, they're saying daddy, and it starts to have meaning attached to it. So again, we really need to support understanding, so we need to think about helping a child understand what words are and what they mean by showing them at the same time as saying a word, and we need to add meaning to babble. So whereas before we might have just been copying the babble and extending it, now we need to add meaning. So, oh, you're saying dad, dad, or if you make a sound, oh, you want your milk. Now, around 12 to 18 months, we see a really big increase in an understanding of keywords, and that's particularly around nouns, which are the naming objects, so understanding what things are and what they are called, and familiar names, so knowing that this person who is my mummy is called mummy. Again, point becomes much more refined, it's got a lot more different um, meanings attached to it, and they themselves may be able to follow a point and understand what a point means in others.
and around 12 to 18 months we may hope to see the emergence of some single words and these will often be the words that you have used most and in context and they have a definite understanding of. So at this point we really need to expose the children to really key vocabulary and provide them lots of opportunities to hear and see this vocabulary. So thinking about words which are really meaningful to our child and showing them lots of examples of this so that at the same time as hearing a word they can see what we're talking about. So if we're talking about a drink we need to show the child a drink to de develop that understanding. And then at 18 to 24 months, we get a rapid increase in comprehension, so an in, increase in understanding of words. So at this point, we start, the child's starting to understand verbs, so those action doing words, so that now if they hear somebody say, can you jump, they might respond to that by jumping, understand things like eating, drinking, and sleeping. And because the understanding is rapidly emerging, we see that the spoken language is also increasing. So we're getting a wider vocabulary and often still single words. And at this point, what we hope to see is that a child is ready to imitate a lot of words that they hear. So they're trying and experimenting with words. So they hear a word and they copy it. So we still need to keep language nice and simple at this stage. We don't want to bombard a child with um, too much complex language, too much information to process. Because if we use a simple word that is easier to hear, it's easier to understand, and ultimately a single word is easier to copy and say than a sentence. And we also need to allow time and pause to give the opportunity for the child to imitate that language if they choose to. So finally, at two to three, we see how concepts are starting to emerge. So by that, we mean position. So we might see an understanding of things like asking them to put something under the table or put something on the table. They might develop an awareness of size, so things are big or little, and an understanding of some descriptive vocabulary. So that can include things like colors and whether something is wet or dry. So thinking about opposites as well. And it's around two to three years of age that communication really takes off because a child starts to understand that there's different functions to communication. There's different reasons why we communicate. So on a very basic level, and one of the earliest communicative functions is to make requests and express a need. We see that right back in infancy. So when communication becomes intentional, it's to express a need like hunger and tiredness. So that's often one of the very early functions that develops. But then a child also begins to be aware that we can use communication to label things and to comment, so to share information with other people, to tell them something that we're doing just because we want to do that and we want to be sociable. But also communication is really useful for asking for help, so getting clarification and actually for asking questions as well. So that starts to develop around two to three years. So they might start those WH questions, so things like what's that? And as we often know, children between two and three years develop that why question. If they don't necessarily use the WH questions verbally, you might see that the rise in their intonation, so the way their voice goes up at the end, is actually a question. So they might say something like, drink, and we need to cue in that that's a question, it's not a statement. At this point, early grammar also may emerge, so we get things like a, an S on the end of a word to show that it's a plural, there's more than one thing, so socks versus sock, and we might start to get that ing ending so instead of saying jump we might start to get jumping now so you can see how there's a real big leap between two and three in, in the complexity of the language that you'll be hearing and again word combinations emerge and they take various formats so we can think about the content of a sentence so first of all we've got a who and a what doing so that might be Jack bouncing to describe what they're doing it might be mummy eating we also get things like um, a what doing and a to what, so we're thinking about an action word and um, a naming word there, so eating a biscuit, drinking juice. And then we get those extended sentences, which is the who, the what doing and the where, so a baby sleeping in bed. And we also get that possessive, so it's mummy's car or it's 
babies drink. And you can see that often the real central vocabulary around that is an action word. And we tend to find that once a child acquires action words, so those things like sleeping and eating, that really opens up their ability to combine and make word combinations. So what can we do to support and develop communication? So as I said, in, in very early infancy, we need to be really cued in. And I think as parents, we're often quite good at that. So we know our babies better than anyone else. But we need to look at, OK, so what could this cry mean? What about the more subtle um, things that we're seeing? So are we seeing any startled responses that we need to cue into? Do we need to stop what we're doing at the time because they appear um, startled? Or are they making very content vocalization? So they're enjoying something, they're happy, and they need to be kept in, in the state that they're in doing what's happening at that moment. So we really need to cue in because what we need to do, as we've said, is move communication from being pre-intentional, so where the infant doesn't realize that what they're doing is communication, to intentional so that they learn that when they do this, this happens. So we need to look and listen for communications and especially the subtle ones. And we need to be responsive. We need to act on what we see. And then as the child starts to vocalize, we really need to reciprocate. So we need to copy that vocalization. We need to answer them in the way that we would answer an older child or an adult speaking to us. Because we need to show that our babies that we're listening and we need to model early two-wayness of communication. So communication is a very much a two-way process. Someone speaks, someone responds, extends that and someone else responds. So we need to show that in the very early days and we need to model sounds that are useful to communicate. As the child gets a little older, as we've said, we need to add meaning to the vocalizations and babble. And this helps a child refine from experimenting with sounds to beginning to add some meaning to those sounds. So interpreting a babble and thinking, if they were a child that could speak, what could they be saying at that moment and adding a word in there? And we can also model sounds that do already have a meaning attached. And these are called symbolic sounds. So things like animal sounds, vehicle sounds, sounds that we hear in the routine, so saying something like, mmm, when we're eating, or uh-oh, when we drop something. So they're not quite words, but they're not random sounds. They very much have a meaning attached. And these are often very early pre-words that we hear with, with children, and they will imitate those sounds and then begin to use those sounds themselves in play. So the essential thing as the child becomes that little bit older is to support and develop an understanding of words. So we need to know what things are called in order to say them. And we need to show them this in very meaningful ways. So although things like picture books and flashcards are great for teaching vocabulary, we need to apply that into a, a meaningful situation so the child can use that information in their own world. So a picture of a drink is, is great for, for modeling that word, but we need to show them their drink so that they can add that, that meaning and that context for themselves. What we're all really keen for with our children is that they become talkers. We're looking at expressive communication. That's often a real goal for parents. But actually, before we can expect a child to be a, a talker and a good communicator, there are a, a few what we'd call prerequisites before expressive communication. So the first thing that we need is a reasonable level of attention, which is um, sufficient for their age and stage of development. But we need to know that when we're modeling language and we're interacting and speaking to a child, that we do have their attention or their joint attention. So we need to know that the things that we're communicating about, they're looking at or they're sharing with us. We need to make sure that our child's got reasonable listening and looking skills. And that doesn't always mean eye contact. Because what we know about some children um, that that go on to have some additional needs is that eye contact can be very difficult. So it's never about insisting on eye contact, but more that we can be sure that they're listening to us and they may look up towards us or look to what we're talking about. So we know we've got that shared attention. Again, so when we communicate, it's useful communication. I think that's essential to be a good communicator and to use language um, well and socially is that intent to communicate. So we need to know that our child understands that communication has a function, it has a purpose, it's useful. And then the massive thing that we need before 
um, we can expect spoken language is an understanding of words. And as you can see on the slide, understanding can be broken down into um, more stages. So the very basic level of understanding, which comes really early on, is that object function awareness. So by that we mean that we understand that when we see a cup, that that cup contains a drink, and we can have a drink from the cup. It's the understanding of if uh, I see my nappy, that means that it's time for nappy change. And a child can understand all of that by just seeing the object and they don't need to hear the word. So that's the earliest form of understanding. And following on from that, it's the understanding of what we'd call those visual cues. So things like understanding a point. So often if we pointed to something and a child has that awareness of a point, they can look at what we're pointing at and again not need to understand the word that we're accompanying with. So we might say, look Teddy, if we're, just, if we're pointing to a Teddy, the child only really needs to follow our point. But visual cues are really important in supporting that understanding of spoken language. And then we come on to the routine, the everyday, the contextual, which we talked about in an earlier slide. So that's drawing on our environment to understand. So it might be that at the same time every day, mum says, daddy's home. And then actually when we hear that, daddy comes through the door. We don't necessarily have to understand those words. We just have to understand that at that time, at that in the day when mum says that, my dad walks through the door. And it's drawing on all that information to help understand. And finally, when we've got all those things in place, we start to see that single word level of understanding emerge. And what we mean by that is we could ask a child, go get your ball, or in a picture book, where's the duck? And the child will be able to respond to that. But they only actually need to respond to that single word. So if we said ball, and we used the right intonation, they understood it, they would probably be able to go and find the ball for us. And following on from single word, that's when we get two-step, and I've put two-step plus because that's when language starts to develop. We're understanding more concepts. We're understanding longer strings of sentences. So as we can see from that slide, there's lots of things that we need to have in place before we can be a verbal communicator. So if we don't know what something is called, how do we say the word? So how do we support understanding? How do we develop understanding? So we try and make it very, very visual. So show your child what you mean. If you want them to put their coat on, you show them the coat at the same time because they will very likely have that object function understanding. They'll have that routine and contextual understanding. And then you're adding the word alongside. So you're showing them what they mean, but you're using a clear and consistent word and you're developing their understanding that way. You need to keep language really simple because the longer and the more complex language you use, the harder it is to follow and pick out the words that are important. So in the early days, we need to keep language at single or two words so that the language we use is exactly what we're talking about. We've talked a bit already about modeling in lots of different ways and modeling in meaningful ways. So again, we'll go back to the example of a drink. So you show them their drink, you show them daddy's drink, you may show them a picture of a drink, if you're out and about you also show a drink in different places so that eventually a child learns that it's not just my cup with water in that's called a drink, there are lots of different types of drink and you need to model it consistently so we need to try and think about using the same words at the same time to build up on that routine understanding and eventually the understanding of the word on its own. So the next couple of slides are just thinking about some real good practice if we think about how to help and support our child to become a communicator and a good communicator. So face-to-face -face interaction is really important when you're working with a child and you're supporting their communication. So you need to get down to the child's level and join in the play that they've self-selected. So we often talk about things being child-led. So sitting back and watching what they pick to play with and then getting down at their level. Because this means that it's easier for them to communicate with you. They don't have to turn around and locate and find where you are. And it's easier for you to notice what it might be that they're trying to communicate with you. So if you're down on the floor with them, you're watching what they're doing, you're playing with what they've selected, then you might be able to interpret what they might be trying to communicate with you. It also means that it's much easier for a child to give you eye contact when you're down on that level. And we know that eye 
contact is important because a child can look at you for help and confirmation. So they might look at you to help them do something in their play or confirm that what they're doing is right or confirm that a word that they're saying is the right word. We know that if we've got eye contact, the activity is shared because you're both looking at the same toy and each other, and this is very much what we call shared attention. And you can tune into what your child is showing or telling you, even if they're not speaking. So if we sat up on the chair while our child's down on the floor, we might miss some of the more subtle communications, so a smile or them showing us something. Whereas if we're down at their level watching what they're doing, we can see all that communication that happens aside from the words they're saying. So there's a concept that's called um, OWLing, and that stands for Observe, Wait and Listen, and again, very much goes on the child-led concept. So it's about initially sitting back and watching what your child is doing, so that when you do use language to, to talk about what they're doing or what they're playing with or naming, you know that it's relevant to what's happening at the time. Wait for your child to initiate communication. And when we're keen to support communication, we sometimes feel like we need to do all the talking. And sometimes we need to think that it's actually quality versus quantity. So if we wait for our child to initiate communication, we know that they want to communicate with us. They're trying to tell us something or show us something, and we can support that with the language. So that might be through words, so they may show you something and tell you what it is. It might be through sound, it might be through eye contact or gestures. We need to wait for them to do that with us and then go into communication. And we need to listen. So really good listening skills. Is the child attempting to actually say a word or are they saying a sound which we can then interpret and add meaning to or respond to appropriately or remodel so that the word is more refined? So when we're thinking about good practice, we need to think about questions. And as adults, we're really guilty of asking children lots and lots of questions, particularly things like, what's that? What are you doing? And we do it with the best intentions to support a child to use language. But actually, we need to think about the type of questions we ask our child, because too many questions can put pressure on a child to talk. And if they can't talk or they do have a limited vocabulary, then we can't expect that they're going to answer that question. So in a way, that can end an interaction because you ask a question, the child's unable to respond, so then you're unable to extend that. And also it can end an interaction for a child who is verbal. So if you ask them what they have and they reply a ball, it's sometimes really difficult to extend that and the child themselves isn't given the opportunity to extend it. So we need to think about good questions that are pitched at the right level for a child. So a most basic question that can support the development of vocabulary is by giving a child a choice. So if we know that a child enjoys playing with different toys such as cars and books and balls, we can give them that choice. So would you like the car or the ball? And you can show your child at the same time. You're modeling good language. You're showing them. You're asking a question, but they've got lots of ways that they can communicate back. They can either do that verbally or they can reach or they can point for what they want. A question that encourages thinking as the child gets over is really useful, so asking them why something's happened or how they've done something. And it can also encourage creative thinking and descriptive language, but again, that's at a slightly higher level to a child who is learning language in the early days. So if we think about a child with additional needs or a child who is experiencing a language delay, the most important thing to think about is those prerequisites to expressive language. So if we think about one of the earlier slides about all the things that we need in place before we can expect a child to be a good talker, we need to think about whether those things are in place and if they're not, we need to target those areas of need. So if we think at the moment the child doesn't necessarily have an intent to communicate and they don't think it's useful, we need to think of activities to show them that it is useful. And as I say, one of the basic functions of language is to meet a need. So we need to think of activities that they really enjoy and see if we can get them to communicate to show they want it again. So for example, something like bubbles, blowing the bubbles and then pausing and seeing if we can get them to communicate in any way to show us that they want that bubbles to happen again. And we're starting to teach them there that communication is important and give them that intent. 
we may need to start working on attention so building up their attention from very short tasks and seeing if we can extend that and of course we need to extend their understanding if we feel that that's an area of need and we've talked about doing that by supporting with visual cues whether that's pointing and using gestures or showing them the object and we need to build on their vocabulary so once they understand what objects are and can understand our cues, we need to start teaching them the names of things in lots of different ways. So as I said, you need to give your child reasons and opportunities to communicate. Think about what motivates them. Think of very interactive playing. So going with following their lead, watching what they're choosing to do, and building communication opportunities into, in that. So if they need some help with something, sitting back a little bit, waiting for that initiation so that they can see that there's a reason to communicate. And often giving a child choices can give them an opportunity to communicate, as we've said before. If a child is verbal but what they say is quite limited, we can repeat what they say, we can extend it. So if we're thinking about helping a child make word combinations, we talk about something called the plus one rule. So for example, if a child showed us a book and said book, we could say read book or a big book or book please and we're adding on another word so we're showing them the different ways that you can combine language. So sometimes a child who is experiencing more significant difficulties and where spoken language isn't developing as we'd want to may need to think of something called AAC and this is augmentative and alternative communication and what I would say about AAC is it's something that you should consider only with the support of a healthcare or educational professional and that's to ensure that you're picking the right approach for you and your child there's lots of different AAC approaches and we need to know that what we're putting in place is the right one so one form of AAC is Makatom so this is a communication system that uses signs and symbols some people might be familiar with Makaton from the children's program something special on Mr Tumbles and Makaton was designed for um, children and adults with learning difficulties but now is used much widely with a variety of difficulties and in particular difficulties with understanding and use of spoken language so it is a communication system it adds an extra cue alongside spoken language and it's always must be used alongside the word so it's not meant to replace um, support in developing spoken language it's, it, it's an addition to spoken language we say, we say the word as well as we sign it and it should not impact on a child's ability to develop spoken language so we can also use pictures or photos to help a child express a need so by this we mean showing them the picture or photo or presenting it to them which is the right medium so should it be a photo should it be a picture should it be a symbol so by that we need to think if our child is a flexible thinker so if we show a photo of a packet of crisps what we need to be sure of is that if the child points to that packet of crisps and we give them a flavor that's not on that picture can they cope with that or would they be expecting that packet of crisps that they see in the picture the other thing that we need to think about is whether our child can initiate or whether we need to do that so can they approach us to meet a need so would they be able to go and get those pictures and bring them to us or do we need to do that initiation do we need to look for the cues for example that they might be hungry or it might be that time of day when they need to eat and bring those pictures photos or symbols to them some children have real difficulties with initiation so we would need to do that for them and we can also think about communication aids so we think about low tech and high tech so the low tech communication aids are the symbols that we've talked about and communication books so if a child becomes um, quite good at using those symbols we can put that in in books that um, different pages serve different purposes so there may be a page for eating a page for activities a page for family and they can get progressively more complex as we follow the child's levels and needs at uh, low tech can we can also think about what we call single switch devices so things like a large button where you press it and a spoken word or a spoken sentence is activated and often this is used by targeting things like motivators or basic needs so for example recording the word more and a child being able to press that in a motivating activity to request that it happens again 
and then we can think about high tech and these are the electronic devices and they'll have multiple communicative functions so they're not just based on meeting a need they can be based on making comments the child constructing their own sentences and they'll often have a voice output but this needs to very much move with a level of the child we need to make sure that the child has the right level of understanding for that communication aid and as we said we need to think about getting the support of healthcare or educational professionals when we're thinking about communication aids and there are services that would assess a child's readiness and level and give them an appropriate communication aid so I'd never advocate that a parent would go out and source those themselves without seeking the advice of others and ultimately if you are concerned about your child's speech and language development whether that's an isolated area of need or it's part of a wider range of additional needs then you really should be seeking the advice and support of others so you need to find out how you can refer to your local service so this may be an open referral which means that anyone can refer to, including yourselves or you may need to speak to a health visitor or your GP to make that referral you can also find out uh, what's being offered in your local community such as groups and information sessions that may or may not require a referral into speech and language therapy but it's always useful to seek the advice of a speech and language therapist if you have concerns and they may be able to give you advice and support and um, or they may need to move that on to more targeted work thanks Joanne and thank you all for listening if you have any questions, please type them into the comment box on the right-hand side of your screen, and we will answer them now. Okay, Joanne, so we have one question for you. How can you tell the difference between a hungry cry and a distressed cry? Okay, so what we know about cries is that they vary in pitch and intonation and the length of the cry, and that's not necessarily the same for each baby it differs on an individual baby's basis but it would be about a parent tuning into that so into that intonation that pitch that length of cry and adding some context so interpreting whether they feel that um, the child may be hungry or tired at that moment in time and sometimes in the early days it's very much trial and error for a parent but they'll quickly see whether by feeding them they've met that need and then refine that communication themselves it's also about cueing into the other things that are happening at the time so what's the child's body language telling us what's their eye contact doing and using all that information to help interpret the cry and another question what is the average age that you might start to notice your child was having communication difficulties it's widely um, variable what we tend to say as a rule of thumb is that by about 18 months we'd be hoping to see a vocabulary of around 10 words that we used with meaning and as a rule of thumb by around two years of age we'd be hoping for quite an extensive range of single words and beginning to see some of those two word combinations so what we know is that um, a lot of children can be delayed in learning to talk without actually having um, a language difficulty but what we would be more concerned about and feel that we would need to offer intervention earlier than a two and a half year old who wasn't speaking was if the prerequisites to communication weren't there so if we felt that sort of by 18 months we weren't seeing that understanding of some basic words and if we felt that the child did not appear to have an intent to communicate with other people those would be our initial indicators something to be concerned about we'd also may be more concerned if we hadn't heard the earlier babble emerging because if a child has all the babble strings and consonants and vowels that we would expect but simply isn't saying words but we know that they've got a good understanding they're showing an intent to communicate we'd be less concerned that a child that appeared to have missed a babble stage or was not showing that level of understanding and in addition we'd also look in the context of if a child has a wider range of additional needs which may um, indicate that they are likely to have some speech and language difficulties Thanks for those questions, and if you think of any other questions after this webinar, you can contact Joanne through the email address on the screen now. And be sure to check the Firefly website to register your interest for our upcoming webinars. Thanks, everyone.